Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Research at Home. Um, this morning, we have um, Dr. Eva Hartel with us, um, straight from Haninge in Sweden. Um, Eva is an academic, she's a researcher. Um, this morning, she'll be talking to us about comparative judgment, um, which is clearly a really, really interesting topic at the moment. Um, Eva has uh, been a co-organizer of uh, Research Ed Scandinavia for quite a few years, so she has done a lot of work with Research Ed and uh, she has managed to create some fantastic programs over there. Um, so we're very grateful for that. Um, and this morning, um, she will be talking for about 40 minutes, perhaps 45 minutes. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. So if you want to send in your questions, uh, all you need to do is to use the Q&A function and uh, we'll try and respond to them at the end of the, of, of the presentation. Um, without further ado, Eva, if you're ready, do you want to take over? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I will share my screen. So, see the first slide. Um, hi everyone, my name is Eva Hartel and I am so happy to welcome you to my home and I'm at your home. Uh, really strange times that we are living in. I will talk to you about comparative judgment, something that I find so very interesting. And I hope I can share my enthusiasm for it. But I also want you to think about what's in it for you. Because I can't say what's in it for you. I just want you to, to think for yourself. And I think it's a digital facilitator to improve teachers' assessment practices. And I think it would, may contribute to like, increase affordances for teachers' assessment practices. And by affordance, I mean the quality of the environment where you as teachers are situated in. I framed this uh, presentation uh, for these two quotes. These two quotes mean a lot to me when I work as a researcher in Harningen Municipality and at KTH Roland Institute of Technology. I work with teachers and I work with school leaders as well. But assessment is key. If you, if you teach something that kids doesn't necessarily learn everything they're taught. And as Professor Lindstrom says, a teacher who fails to assess what the students do cannot decide whether or not she's contributing to or impeding their progress. So it's really important to assess. And as Professor Dylan Williams says, every teacher needs to improve, but not because they're not good enough, but because it can get even better. And that's something I believe strongly in. And I, I think perhaps maybe comparative judgment could be a tool to, to increase and improve teachers' assessment practices and the environment is situated in. My research and my interest is focused on classroom formative assessment. And there are lots of theory and lots of practices and lots of interpretations of classroom formative assessment. assessment. And, but it's based, when you break it down, it's, it's based on two principles, that students don't learn everything they're taught and good teaching starts from where the students are. But the one point that is really key to remember is to use the evidence and to adapt what happens next. If you, don't, if you just collect data and you don't use it, don't bother collecting it. And it also has three legs. I will present to you some examples of how we have used comparative judgment mostly in STEM subjects. It has been used in elsewhere as well. And I think you can see, I hope you can see, how you can adapt to your context. But please remember, um, key informative assessment is feedback. And it's fe your feedback to your students, but it's also the feedback that you receive from your students, because you as a teacher are also learners. And this is very subject specific or domain specific. It's not the way, teaching in physics, it's not the same as teaching in, for instance, English writing. However, there are some generic, but there are also some subject specific that we need to acknowledge. That's why I have this stool, three legs, and all the three legs will make it steady. Mm. Well, 
I, I'm supposed to talk about comparative judgment, but as a Swede, I like really have to talk about the weather. It's a con conversation starter and it opened up for a different, like a dialogue. And it's May, it's May 19 even. And the weather outside is, well, I'm in Sweden and the weather is like pretty British, I would say, to my experience. It's like a bit gray and it's not as sun, much sun, sunshine as it usually is. And actually, it's quite cold outside, not as cold as, as it is in, for instance, January or um, at the, I don't know, Antarctica. And, but it's cold compared to what I'm used to, the weather is in May here in Sweden. And also, I'm pretty confident that it's warmer inside than outside. Actually, I could measure how much warmer it is inside than outside using a thermometer. But when I compare, I, I'm, I'm maybe I'm satisfied just to say, well, it's warmer inside than outside, or I can use the thermometer. But then I need to make sure what, that we are talking, uh, that we're using the same thermometer scale, the temperature scale. And as a Swede, I prefer the Celsius scale, and perhaps Americans prefer the Fahrenheit. I don't know, but we need to make sure that we are using the same scale when we're talking and we're measuring the temperature. So why am I talking about temperature and why am I comparing the weather here in Sweden to Britain and to my experience what May weather is? Well, I'm comparing. That's how I judge. I use my own experience and I compare. I use that quite often actually. And speaking of comparing and using my experience, our pony Prescott, he just hurt his foot and we need to make sure that his foot is not um, infected or that he gets swollen. And how do I do that? Well, I compare. I, uh, I feel, I use my hand on his right foot and in the left foot and I compare. Is it swollen or is it warmer? Or I don't need a thermometer. Just use my judgment and I compare. And I'm talking about the weather and everything, but when I, I used to be a STEM teacher, I worked for over 10 years and I had all kinds of different um, assessment, uh, teaching and learning activities. And sometimes I ended up with a pile like this. Uh, there were design activities and um, investigations and such. And after a while, I ended up with this pile of student work. And I knew this is a good, I could like identify quite quickly, this is a good piece of work. And I also could identify quite, high, quite quickly, this is a pile of work that needs some serious consideration. How could we do that? Well, I used my professional judgment. The problem was that I had not, not so many others to compare with. What about the classroom next to mine? Maybe someone else at another, some other kids at, in another school could perform much better than my students. I don't know because I had, I, I couldn't, I just use my judgment in my classroom and use my experience. I might, might, should mention that in Sweden, it is the teacher who decide upon which grade to award. We don't have national tests. We only had it for moderation in some subjects, but in most of the subjects we don't, it's up to me. So I really need to. And at the same time, what is easy assessed might not be what we want to, want our kids to learn. We want to open and their tasks with big, hairy, audacious goals, but it's really hard. So how can I do? Well, I can use my professional judgment, but I need some colleagues to use it, uh, to moderate with. And I can do this. And I, I really think that comparative judgment, we do that intuitively, but we need to make it even more, um, we can make it better, so to speak. And comparative judgment is a methodology. It's, it's over a hundred years old. It comes from psychology uh, and it has been used in education for quite some time now, but only the recent couple of years, it has boomed like this and all kinds of studies are just exploding. Maybe 10 years ago, there weren't that many. It was like Pollitt, for instance. Alistair Pollitt was the one who like sort of introduced it to education. And what did it, it relies on pairwise comparisons. This one compared to that one. If you see these two flowers, it's from, from one of the schools in Harlingen. And this is not all, all the, what they do, but it, this is two pieces of work. And we compare which one is better than that one. Well, I prefer the one to your, how do you say? your left uh, because that's what I think is like more beautiful 
However, when the Pooh says, we need to, it's better to know what to look for before you start looking for it. Hmm. Is it like uh, realistic art or is it more abstract that we want them to, to practice on now? I don't know. Let's think ahead before we do. So comparative judgment relies on pairwise comparisons of work. You are presented with two pieces and then another pair, another pair. And this is what sort of our brain can cope with. We can compare two things at a time. Here is another example uh, from uh, welding uh, in Japan. And this here are the experienced expert teacher who present to her, his student on what a good melt look like. And he compares this piece with that piece. He doesn't use the word compare to judgment, but that is what he's doing. And he shows and he pinpoints and he invites his student to see what he as an expert can see and use the exemplars to illustrate that. And you also use his professional words. What if he only was supposed to, to write this down and communicate it? I don't think, I think it's better to, to mirror, to see that compared to that one. Digital compared to judgment. Thanks to uh, the, the digital um, tools that are available, there are different kinds of tools. Uh, we can now facilitate compared to judgment with digital software. And that is, we can also have digital portfolios like this, where we can capture different, uh, different um, evidence of learning, but we can also facilitate the collaboration between different teachers, different, even different teachers across the globe, actually. And I will give you some examples of that. But what, it's the same basic, you compare, like I compare the weather to, where, to outside. I compare Prescott's hoof the, 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 the one he has hurt but compared to one that is his, which is okay. And we compare this portfolio to that portfolio. And we choose one, which one is better. We don't have to say how much better, just this one is better. And then we present it with two more and two more and two more and two more, only two, two at a time. And what happens? Well, this is just an illustration. Imagine these bullets are portfolios or essays or arts or whatever pieces of student work and we compare it's like a Swiss tournament two 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 and what happens well half of them will win and then the second round half of them will win and then half and half and then it, it ends up like a like a ranking some of them will win and some of them will not win and what happened it's like this it's a rank order, but it's not a rank. Rank order is like, woo, woo. Uh, we don't rank kids, but the student work is ranked here. But it's not like a rank, traditional rank order. It's not much more sophisticated than that. It's a professional consensus from the group of judges. And the judges who have done these comparative judgments, pairwise comparisons, can be teachers. It could be pupils, students. It can even be research, research grants offices. And as you can see, I can press like number 14, for instance, and I can see what the number 14 looks like. And I can press somewhere else and see, oh, that's a blue. Someone has written, uh, drawn a, a technical drawing here and by, by paper and pen. And also, oh, I can see the, the technical drawing, the digital technical drawing as well. And I all have it there. And I can share this with, with my colleagues and friends and my students. And speaking of uh, rankings, I, I don't see the point in ranking schools, but I see the point in using the, quality, the quantitative data and the rankings. Here's an example from, I haven't published it yet, but it was a, a, two teachers, four classes, two year nines and two year sevens at the same school. And they did the same design task. And this uh, was the result and the year nine, I mean, they're two years older than year, the year seven and they outperformed the year nine. It, it wasn't that surprising. However, you could see, if you look really closely, you could see that there are some year seven, like seven A, seven A and seven B in maybe a, 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 um, number 15 or something. And what about, so what happened then was that the teachers who were involved, they were like, 
oh, what am I going to do? How can we challenge year seven? Because they're stuck with us for two more years in technology education. How can we challenge them so that they will prosper even more? And then when we looked at the bottom line, there weren't only year seven in the bottom line of the 100 students. There were quite a few year nines as well. And so, and they were like, they really thought about how they, what, what they have done during the, um, their teaching and how could they challenge the, the kids more? How can they support them even better? So it opened up for discussion, this ranking. And also I colored the genders. I knew, I knew who the students were. I know that gender and I also colored the gender. And I might not have to tell you, but it was green was the girls. And we can see that the girls outperformed like the, 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 the boys. Well, that is nice, but what about the boys? We didn't need to support them. And that is an area of discussion that we have, at least here in Sweden at the moment. How can we support the boys? And this was in technology education. Here's another study from, uh, there were 250 kids, 10 teachers, and they worked with chemistry, uh, food chemistry, you could say. And they did lab laboratory work, they, did, they brought, wrote something, there was some content knowledge, and they made a portfolio. And these uh, 10 different schools, they were from different socially economic areas, so to speak. Some like, like rich areas and some more challenged areas. And the teachers who, they worked with the same talks and the, the students did as well. And then the teachers assessed all the 250 uh, portfolios with comparative judgment. And this was the results. And then we colored each school with a different color. And we told each teacher which color their school got. Uh, um, so teacher A knew her color, but she didn't know the other colors uh, in the school. And when we showed them, we were a bit hesitant to show the teachers first, but we sort of did it anyway. And what happens then was that one of the uh, teachers who work in a, like a really challenged area, and she said, oh, wow, I didn't know my students were that good. And she felt like really proud and like, wow, she like told me that she got a different perspective of her students. So it challenged her bias towards her, her own students. So it, it was, it opens up for more discussions. So I think the rankings can, can be like really powerful. And also here, this is a study. The second is, is a study from, from the TURG, the Technology Education Research Group at, at Lon and at University of Limerick in Ireland. They also work at KTH, so they, my, my, most of my colleagues. But they did like a really cool study with, with a couple of teachers and it was so, some sort of economics subject. And we tell 12 teachers, they wanted to uh, they design a task together and it, can, it was some sort of uh, the students were practicing to write a letter of complaint. They also, because they were supposed to practice uh, to learn how to write learning intentions so they, and criteria, so they formulated six criteria. Uh, and everyone was in agreement that they really liked the task and all the six criteria were equally important. And then a couple of students tried the task and they uploaded it in the, in the software. And then the teachers did the comparative judgment, two at a time, two at a time. And then this was the result. And they were like, oh, wow, this is, so what does this say us? What, what, what can we say, for, what can this diagram tell us? Well, if you look at between 19 and 20, there's something like, we, what, what's, what has happened there? And then they could press and see and look at uh, the, into the 20 and above. And then they noticed that the 20 and above, they have fulfilled the six, all the six criteria, whereas the one in the bottom had not. So there was something about the six criteria that was even that more important than others. So it made them think and said, so, and they reflected, so have we actually taught them how to perform according to the six criteria? To, it was a, to write an argument that to, to, to we argue for their sake. And then they say, well, maybe we haven't. So it, it was an area of, it opened up for more discussions. And the reliability of above 90, which is very, very high. 
And also the teacher said, oh, um, we got a shared consensus, but also a shared responsibility. So they liked the idea. Um, so th there are lots of applications. You can use it for so many things. And I will, I will uh, again, I want you to think what's, what's in it for you. Uh, my main interest is as, to use it as a research, research method. But also you can like moderate yourself, like the one, uh, the teachers who, uh, the first example I showed you, when the rankings like this and the year nine outperformed the year seven, but there were some year sevens who actually were so you can, you can moderate yourself. And like when I was a teacher, I used to think like this cohort of year nines was like really, really good uh, compared to the rest, but was it? But maybe I have lowered my standards. So you can moderate yourself. You can moderate with other teachers. Um, the third example uh, is how we use it is, um, we were, my colleague and I, being a bit school, we were interested in finding out what does teacher assess? Uh, what do they focus on? What's criteria for success in technology education in primary school in Sweden? We didn't know that, so we, we were like, we want to find it. So how can we do that? Well, there are different opinions. You can ask teachers and interview them, or you can make classroom observations. But we thought it was, we couldn't like dig into what we wanted to see. So we tried. And we had, um, we tried to, to use a comparative judgment. And we collected data. There were, this was an open ended task. And the teacher I might say, uh, the teacher also um, who taught the, the 11 year olds, she said, This is a good uh, task for my students here in, uh, as well. And it was an already, it was designed by Kimball and Stables and it has been used in England as well, but that doesn't necessarily correspond to the Swedish curriculum. But the teacher uh, that we work with, uh, she said this is a good task as well. So she sort of validated the task. Anyway, and the, the kids, they, they work with this and they collected the evidence themselves. They built a prototype and also they, they built themselves using iPads. Um, throughout the, this, to, to um, document the design process, so to speak. So we had both the prototype and the process, which is fairly good because if you are into design education and technology education, you can't just focus on the product. product. I mean, the Taco Bell tubs, it, it's not so maybe attractive as an artistic attractive, but maybe what's the thinking behind this? It's not an art competition, it's something else. And we could, we, th we think we could capture that really well using these portfolios where the student could speak, they could film, they could write. And then we had five teachers and they, through comparative judgment, they were presented with two portfolios, two at a time. And every time they choose one as better than the other one, they were asked to say why to provide a motif. And they were recording in an MP3 player, which we transcribe and analyze. So we had quantitative data and we had a qualitative data, the thinking behind it. And that was so, I, mean, I, I still get goosebumps because it was so interesting to see what they have written and like dig into their expertise and their, and their thinking in the, in, in the exact moment when they were doing these judgments. And uh, what we did see? Well, we got the ranking and it was 90, uh, above 95. I don't remember exactly, but I think at least above 95 reliability. That's very high. And also, and we knew that because compared to judgment results in high, higher reliability than in other traditional ways of, of assessing. But what I found even more interesting was that the qualitative data, there's think aloud protocols, they also corresponded, they were in consensus, what is important to students? Well, what, what is important for the students to show? The narrative, the story, the röda linjen, as we say in Swedish, start to end. And uh, it wasn't that surprising because in design and technology education and product development, it is sort of a, a narrative. Uh, but now we, we didn't know that for sure, but now we do. And also we found that the teachers also said it's important that all the subtasks are fulfilled. And we thought, well, 
maybe it is because they want to see the whole narrative and of course but also maybe it could be like what about the students who do as they're told do what the teacher says which is is, is sometimes it's good but you need to communicate the why behind it Um, we're talking about uh, clarifying and sharing and understanding learning intentions and criteria for success. It's one of the five key strategies for formative assessment. But why? Just because I'm interested in it? No, that's not the, the main point. Why is it important to share these? I just want you to think for yourself for a while. Unfortunately, I can't see how you, if your finger wrote like this, but I mean, all of, of these four um, items, it, it's correct, but the D is not, perhaps not the most important, but actually, if you can communicate the criteria for success, it benefits all your students, but particularly the low achievers. Uh, it's a spread, quite a lot of literature that support this. And um, for instance, Anders Jönsson, who's a Swedish professor, he has shown quite, if you have this, uh, the range of uh, achievers in your student group and then everyone benefits but the low achievers sort of catch you close the gap if you are thorough by clarifying and sharing learning intentions and there are different ways to do that and I will show you another way to do it and we were sort of interested my two friends uh, three friends Greg Scott and Emily at Purdue University uh, we have came, um, met each other on different conferences and we talked about technology education and such. And we wanted to, we were like curious, what, what, what is like criteria for success in an international context? And then we need, um, we only did it just because we were curious. And so we had some student portfolios and products. Um, there were 760 students and they worked in groups. So we ended up with um, 175 portfolios and products and then we it was a design they were supposed to uh, design a pill dispenser for an elderly traveling uh, a people um, a person who travels a lot um, and we collected the data and it's well actually the students did but and then we our data collection to use comparative judgment in America in Sweden and in the UK because we, um, Scott and Emily and, and uh, Greg are at Purdue, so they are in the American context, I'm in Sweden, so in the Swedish context, and also England. England has a strong tradition of, uh, in technology and education research, so that's what, why, why we chose these different countries. So we gathered judges, and the judges were teachers, some high academic, and some teachers and some teacher educators within these three different contexts. And they assess the same student work, like for these. But in the, so three groups um, of people in three different countries. They did comparative judgment on the portfolios. And they did comparative judgment on the prototypes. And what happened? Well, we were so super excited to see the results because we, we well, we didn't know. And we don't. Uh, say that is it. We, we didn't select them as a statistical. We just we selected people that we knew and knew of, so they are not like um, random selected. And but anyway, we ended up with these results. So group um, at the, these other prototypes, we ended up with results. Uh, we have under, other results for the for the portfolios as well. But what was so interesting was that there wasn't that that it was like the same order of the, of the, within these, between these uh, groups. We got really high reliability, reliability within the groups, but not between. And we were like, ah, what does this mean? Well, we had, a, we, we could actually see, we could like see what is group 122, because there was something with group 122 their portfolios and also about the prototypes that attracted um, the judges in the American and the UK in the Swedish context. But what, what does it look like? Well, we wanted to see. So this is what it looks like. But we need, and also we had the comments 
to explain what they saw. So we had the, the qualitative data and the quantitative data to, to interact and, and blend, so to speak. And here are the top one, uh, top ranked prototype in Sweden. What does it look like? And what kind of words do the judges use? Well, usability and design and the size. Sort of less is more. A bit simplistic interpretation here, but less is more, which is a bit of a bias uh, in terms of Swedish design. And the Americans, they, use, they also uh, focus on usability and design and size, but what kind of words did the judges use when they described this? Well, they use love, for instance, and none of the sweets, I don't have to say this perhaps, but none of the sweets use the word love, whereas the Americans did. And also when we looked at, in, when we studied what kind of, how the design, what they look like, the prototypes, it was a little bit more, um, you have to ex uh, excuse my English here, but my is but bling bling Chinese things, which is a bit more red alert for bias towards American design, perhaps. We don't know. Uh, but we found that the conclusion was that because we wanted to see what, 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 what do we find? Well, it, I we really think it's it, um, comparative judgment can use can be useful to unpack teachers' assessment practices. We use this in three different contexts. Perhaps you, maybe you can use it in between different schools or between different teachers, I don't know. Um, but it's useful to explicitly criteria for success in open under design. And also it serves as a catalyst for discussion because I can assure you this that he caused quite a lot of interesting discussions within the community. So, uh, what drives me as a researcher is uh, how, what teachers think about the things. And I thought, just because I'm very enthusiastic uh, as a researcher, well, what about the teachers who are involved in the studies? What do they think about comparative judgment? Well, they said, well, I'm not alone, for instance. Equity for the students um, as a, like overarching because you are exposed just to one, you sort of left out for just one teacher here. But here you could share because there were different, you can, you as a teacher could be part of a community. And also they said, oh, nice to see other than my own student work. Hmm? And, the, the, and also like they gave them opportunities to get the flavor of what other students, how they can perform because it, it's not that often you get the opportunity to see other than your own students and how they perform, which is enough, I guess, because you have a lot of things to do, but it's good to get a, favor, a flavor of what other students can do as well. And as I said, said earlier in this presentation, one of the uh, teachers said, oh, I did not know my students were that good. And just to get that <sighs> relieved, as a teacher to see that your students actually are, you see them as, um, I, I, I'm sure that they see their students as like really good students, but, and that, that you perform really well, but to see that that actually perform even better than what they thought, it's really nice. So, so stimulate dialogue, how can you do that? It's really, really important to stimulate dialogue among your colleagues and also to stimulate dialogue among the students. And comparative judgment can really serve as a catalyst for discussion. And you don't need any software like this. When they compare the welding and what the good melt looks like, you compare this one to that one. You don't need a software to do that, but it may help, it facilitates. And I think here at ICT can really, really um, facilitate teachers to collaborate. And I think it may, might contribute to increased affordances which teaches assessment practices. And all of it, I don't, this might be stretched a bit too much, but um, comparative judgment is used also in wine tasting. And wine connoisseurs, they can like talk about wine. And I, I mean, I drink wine and so, but I'm not a connoisseur. And I say, 
well, this, well, this tastes good perhaps, but my uncle, he's a wine connoisseur and he can really describe what a wine is and what, is, what, the, um, what particular wine goes with what particular food and what particular dessert even and, and such. And what he does is when, when he goes, uh, not at the moment, but when he travels around France, the different vineyards, and he actually tastes it and then he compares to another and then they taste a sip and it spits. I'm not sure if it spits, but he says he does. He sips and, he, mm, and then he compares, mm, compare that one. And then he ends up buying one bottle or one particular wine. Maybe he buys different kinds, uh, different amount of bottles. Anyway, that's details. But what I'm trying to say here is that wine connoisseurs, they can use the experience and they talk to other expertise and they have something to talk about. They don't, don't just talk about it. They actually experience it together. And I think it's important that teachers and also students get the opportunity to experience and talk to other people. What is, what, what is criteria for success? What can it look like? What can it look like? You can't just, it's just not one way to do, not just one way to solve a problem, for instance. But what can it look like? And you need someone to talk to about that. So which one is better than that and why? And here ICT can serve as a servant instead of the driver. Here in Sweden, there are so many pushes for, uh, for digital tools. You get like, like flooded. But lots of tools that solve problems that you don't even know you had. But here, I think ICT and comparative judgment software can bring people together in a fairly easy way. Because you, you don't have to be at the same spot at the same time. You can collaborate using the cloud and you can be at home or in a school in America or in, a, uh, or in Sweden, for instance. And which one is better than that one? You try, almost like the wine tasting. You can try, you can, you can press here and you can try. You can press here, you can try. You can also provide feedback to your learners. What if teach, different teachers could provide different feedback to students? That would be super exciting to investigate. What, what do they uh, focus on? And I'm not the only one who have thought about involving students. Thanks to my colleagues at University of Limerick and at Lon in Ireland, they have already. And it's so cool to see and also to see the courage to actually explore and reflect upon how they, what they are doing and, and then tweak it a little bit. Here's a study that they did. They, they, they came across uh, comparative judgment and wanted to try that on their teaching uh, education program. The students, they were technology engineering students, um, teacher students, and they were designing uh, a bird feeder. Um, and the bird feeder was supposed to measure their intelligence on feet. It's not really like really hairy fairy, you can say. And how do you assess that? And had the high criteria. And but they sort of they came across comparative judgment. They wanted to, uh, to sort of try it out. So what did they do? Well, here uh, the first round, they let the students work the traditional way, and then they tried peer feedback through comparative judgment. So the students peer, gave peer feedback using comparative judgment. So they were presented with two, two, two of their peers, peer students work. And it was anonymous and they tried it. And afterwards they interviewed the students and they say, the students said, wow, this was, this was pretty cool. It was the first time the students experienced the comparative judgment. And they said, well, uh, since it was anonymous, they were used to giving peer feedback, but providing peer feedback anonymously with just the two, two, two all the time, helped them to be more uh, uh, pinpointing um, and identifying and to like be, be more constructive in their feedback. And also the students, when they received the feedback, they said, oh, this, this feedback is really useful. And also the students said, Wow, the, just being exposed to the wide range of student work helped them to understand the criteria for success that the teacher had communicated to them through rubrics and learning intentions and such. But by seeing this, getting a flavor of their students' work in a, in a range of performances helped them understand. 
and the students were ready to go. They knew exactly what next step to take. Unfortunately, they did not have the opportunity to take the next step during this particular task that they were working with. But fortunately, uh, the research team and the teacher team, they did another round. And here they included, they did a design task, open-ended design task, but they let the students do peer feedback through comparative judgment in the middle, so while learning. And think about, so feedback should be uh, feedback. You should receive feedback while you're learning so you can use the feedback. And this was what, what this round two gave them opportunity to do. So the students gave feedback and received feedback from their peers. And then they continued to work. And in the end, uh, they interviewed uh, and asked the students, so what, what did you think about this? And, and again, they said, well, giving uh, anonymous feedback is really like, helpful. And also that being forced to provide feedback helped them a lot as well. So just receiving and, and uh, giving feedback helped them. Which is, uh, and also giving feedback, Jessica Berggren, she's a Swedish um, researcher uh, in, in um, English as second language. She has also shown that giving feedback is also a very powerful learning tool. And you, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm switching back and forth here, but in this study, the students were uh, given the opportunity to receive feedback and provide feedback. So it was very beneficial. And they could identify areas of improvement. And in the end, so it, says, it says CJ, in the end, the, the research team conducted comparative judgment on all the students' work in the end. And then they could see that actually the, the ones in CJ round one in the middle, they compared the results um, for each every student with, with the, round, the second round. And they could see that the students who were like low achieving in the first round really take a giant leap and performed like much much better in the second round i think that's fascinating i don't know why how, how could that work? Right? we can speculate here but just being exposed and learning how to what the success criteria looks like maybe that helped them and we know from anders jensen's work that low achievers benefits the most from when it's when it's um, clear what is expected of the students and what is a criteria for success. The high achievers in the middle, they also perform better, but not as much. Uh, maybe because they were sort of relaxed and say, well, I, I did really well the first time, or perhaps it was a ceiling effect. The, the, the task that they performed uh, uh, sort of lowered them. The task design is extremely um, uh, important. How do you design the task? Another, um, my other friends at Purdue University, uh, Scott and Emily and Greg, they have done so many studies and I can't even keep track of them. I really recommend you to, to uh, follow them. They're not so active on, on Twitter, but you can follow them through ResearchGate, for instance. And they like produce papers, papers, papers. So they're like amazing. And they do so very cool stuff. I, I like really wish I could, do some of their studies as well and maybe I will soon anyway they had the same uh, similar research design they did similar uh, di slightly different tasks in middle school and at the college or uh, university level but they had a similar research design and it was like this start with a task a student work uh, with a task and did, did work with that and then they did peer feedback. And then they, they uh, randomly selected or regrouped uh, group one and group, group two. And in group one, they provided peer feedback to their pe peers through the traditional way, like two stars in the wish and face to face like this. Whereas the group two, um, who were also randomly selected, they provided peer feedback through comparative judgment. And what did they see? Well, they saw that it was really helpful. And the students also said that, well, 
all the feedback that I received were not that very helpful, but actually the group in who did peer feedback on comparative judgment, they were more content with the feedback they received. And also they were more like proud of what the, the, the feedback they could actually give to their peers. And being exposed to this wide range of exemplars helped them to get a flavor and like a scent or experience what good quality works looks like. And here we have the five key strategies for formative assessment, clarifying learning intents and providing feedback and activating students as learning. I mean, they are all entangled, but it, it's all about the use of evidence of learning. So if you want to, for instance, use like embed peer feedback to compare to judgment in your group, in your, in your classroom, please make sure that they actually have the opportunity to use that feedback and continue and, and learn from the feedback. Don't do it in the end. And also invite your students to your own area of expertise. You, knew, you know a lot of things. And perhaps sometimes it's really difficult to express that in words. Here are the examples from a classroom in one of the Hania schools. And here the, the teacher have illustrated the criteria for different um, gradings, um, different grades. And I, I'm fairly, um, confident in reading criteria, but it's really hairy fairy because it's art and I don't understand what it means. But when I look at these pictures, they're really nice. But again, depends on what you look for. Is it abstract art or is it realistic? So maybe we need to swap it, depends. So remember Winnie the Pooh who says, it's better to know what to look for before you start looking for it. And uh, I mean, invite students to your own areas of expertise. And this is a description of something that I found. And I can, if you want to, you can email me and tell me what this description, what this is a description of. And I will, I will send you whatever. If you can spot what it is, I'll, I'll make sure, I'll promise you that I will send you what it is. This is like, well, what, are, what is this a description of? I don't know. Well, I know, but maybe you don't, I don't know. Uh, compared to this, just see the descriptors of each grade or see the illustrations or even ex being exposed to different wide range of student work. I see the great potential of digital comparative judgment and I see, I mean, data could be collected during ordinary lesson activities, need decision driven data collection, the task, how do you design the tasks that it really works. Consistency and high reliability comes with a, with a story, so to say. say compared to judgment. And when you, if you're interested in, in embedding, uh, in using compared to judgment, please make sure that you have someone to support you to, to interpret the data because you get lots of data. And it is a way to invite other professionals to your classroom and visit theirs without too much trouble. And it's the power of the collective and the profession, something that I cherish, uh, sh cherish, cherish a lot. Hmm, difficult to pronounce. An ICT as a servant instead of the driver. And I hope you have enjoyed this presentation. I would not have been able to do this on my own. And here's, I, I have probably forgotten someone, but there's so many people to thank. And I would really like to thank the participating teachers and the pupils who has been involved in all these studies, because without them, I would not have been challenged enough to even, they challenged me so much to think, I think expand my thinking. And also to all the research audience who make this, this possible. And again, what's in it for you? Think why you want it. Maybe you can try it, but think, so why should you try it? And finally, I just want to send you this message, especially during the unprecedented times that we are living in at the moment. Please remember this. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. We have quite a few questions, Eva. Hmm. I really, really Helen. enjoyed this. Um, it, it really made me think about so many things. Um, and the questions coming in kind of matched the different questions that I had. So we've got questions uh, focusing on students and students' performance and how they uh, improve their 
the attainment um, you know on different pieces of work we've got questions on teacher development and perhaps teacher education as well um, a few questions around the software that you might use uh, and a few questions on the different studies themselves so it's there's a range there if you don't wow. mind um, can I just start with some perhaps more factual questions um, mm -hmm. For example, you, you talked several times about uh, the, the software that you that you were using. Is that something available to people or something you have to, you know, what kind of softwares are out there? The, the oh. one where you can upload the coursework and then see the ranking and then click and see portfolios. That seems amazing. Mm. Well, there are uh, different kinds of software and I will not promote any kind of but, uh, think. So what, what, what do you want to use it for? And what kind of support can you get? Uh, there are uh, RM um, Compare, for instance, and there are No More Marking, and they're also a Belgium. They're both uh, based in the UK, and they're also DPAC, um, that is based in Belgium. And they are popping up different kinds of software, and it the algorithm is it's complicated, but not that much. I mean pairwise competition, like a Swiss tournament. But so there's a lot of mathematics behind it. And I, I really sh think you should, I'm not supposed, I mean, I should give one advice is to see what kind of support can you get to, to interpret the data, I would say. Thank you. Um, I mean, all this sounds amazing, but- I use uh, RM, also RM compare. But, oh. RM compare. It, it, it sounds a little bit time consuming and of course you're, you're describing some, some studies though that would have taken time anyway. Um, I've got very limited experience of comparative judgment myself and I know that the one time that we really tried it, it was really quite time consuming. Mm. Um, can you think of one, first of all, how to avoid that? Is it possible to avoid the, the kind of the workload um, consequences? Uh, and two, is it worth it? Mm. Well, again, what, what, what do you want to use it for? What's the, what, what's the point? What's the, what's the purpose of you or why you try it? It's time consuming, but at the same time, it's not. Because, uh, for instance, the, the Flowbot's friend, when the, when the teachers assess the multimodal portfolios, um, it was 20, five teachers, 25 portfolios, and it was the first time the, student, the, the teachers experienced using compared judgment. It took them one hour. So it's not that much, but on the other hand, one hour is a lot for a teacher in a limited, in a limited amount of time that you have. Um, and I'm very thankful that they um, contributed to the time during the research study. But what they said, what it was so beneficial for them to see a wide range of work. And also in like, um, I don't know how much time it took for the peer assessment, uh, that my colleagues at Purdue at, in Limerick did. But if they are going to do, uh, get, provide feedback, maybe it's worthwhile uh, adding the feedback for compared to judgment, uh, compared to the traditional way. There are studies that have compared the time, in time it takes to do peer feedback traditional way and compared to uh, compared to judgment. And they sometimes it says that the traditional way goes faster and sometimes it says uh, the, the peer feedback compared to judgment way is faster, but I don't know. It, it's really, you can't say that. But again, let the, if it's if it if the students are provided with opportunity to see a broader range of work, and try and taste m more exemplars, perhaps compared to judgment is a really good way. But make sure that they are provided with time to use the feedback because otherwise it's a waste of time anyway. And that is a good principle for formative assessment anyway. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And think um, what you want to think ahead. Yeah, and it's interesting what you've just said. Of course, you know, the students being exposed to all those exemplars is, is a really good thing. But you were talking in the beginning about how it was um, really useful for yourself and then for, for your colleagues to see as well what other teachers and other classes yeah. managed to achieve. Um, really so I, I think it is, you mentioned uh, teacher education. I really think. And uh, we are uh, a colleague, Helena, and I are, are trying to gather lots of, of student exemplars and have we tried to compare the judgment with, with a small group of teacher students. So 
so that they get the flavor during their teacher education they get the flavor of authentic student work because in Sweden when they start to work as a teacher they are the, the one responsible for awarding the grade <laughs> and so do you need to get the like the wine connoisseurs you'd like to build mm. your expertise uh, during your education but it doesn't stop there you you need to grow your expertise when you work as a teacher and I think it's, it can be very valuable to, this is something that I, I'm really looking forward to investigate more, like can you grow your assessment literacy and also your self-efficacy to do this by trying, tasting, getting a scent of a wide range of work together with your colleagues. Because you should not be alone as a teacher, you should, you should uh, grow this capacity together. Are you aware at all, Eva, of, of, of studies that have been published looking at the use of uh, comparative judgment with trainee teachers or just simply for CPD? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm just, uh, I'm collecting, um, there's, I've read some, but I have not uh, um, internalized them so I can speak about them yet. Uh, okay. But I, I really, uh, I really see the potential. Yeah, yeah I, I can and if you to... are, I mostly done uh, given you exemplars in technology and in ed and engineering education, but there are in geography, uh, the DPAC group and Daisy Christoudle, who, who presented yesterday, she's done an amaz amazing work at building the, uh, like, they have so many studies, I, I can't even keep track of them, but it's English writing and that, that's not my area of expertise, but what they do, I, I really think there's a, a great capacity to grow teachers, um, knowledge and the, pro the professionalism so to speak mm -hmm. by this so for, you should really follow she, she didn't talk about that yesterday but really, you can learn a lot from her from daisy yes, yes. Uh, a lot, lots of very interesting stuff coming out there yeah. so perhaps you could invite um people who have you know watched the video to perhaps share uh, any studies that they're aware of or, or perhaps what, oh, yeah. what they do in their own schools uh, if they do use uh, this kind of methodology um, as yeah. part of the provision for, for teacher training. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so we also had you talked about a study where you realised when you looked at the results that some students in year seven were achieving better than some students in year nine, I think. Yeah. Does that mean that the different year groups were, were doing the same task? Yeah, but... Uh... It's about the Swedish context. As a teacher, we don't have like, we have to do this task in year seven, this year in year nine, uh, so to speak. So the teacher can decide if they want to do this, uh, as long as it corresponds to the criteria. Mm -hmm. And so they were, the two teachers, we were, we were just trying this comparative judgment and the digital portfolios. We were supposed to try it in one class, but there were two teachers and they say, well, this time we want to do this with all of our students. So they were two year nines and two year seven. And then they did exactly the same task. And it was to design um, a pill dispenser for a particular um, person. So there was a story behind it as well. And, and then we gathered all the portfolios. And then the, it was eight or nine teachers who, who compared, assessed. And then we ended up with this ranking. And we could see some of the year sevens, they outperformed the year nines. And so how, how do, can we continue to challenge them to become even better? So it's really, it was so interesting to see this, the, how the teachers were sort of reflected upon their own teaching. And that is, is, I, I think it's very important to, to use it as a tool to grow your professionalism. It's not a tool to like, um, to rank teachers or how, just because the year sevens, um, maybe one year seven, uh, one class of year sevens did not do as well as the other one. So it's not to teach, it's not to blame the teacher. It's like, so how can we, how can we like, explore? And um, it's a really catalyst for discussion. Mm -hmm. And the same goes with when we had the 10 schools, like to see how they, because they are biased towards schools as well. But here we can unpack but not to like slap one, uh, oh, I can't say this in English, but I think it's a powerful tool to, to open up. And, and like when the same year nine and year seven, what about the girls and the boys? We, we, we did, they 
had not even considered that before. Because in traditional way, you think that technology education, that's more like a boy, perhaps. But it, no, it, here the girls like really outperform. But in this particular task, in this particular context at that particular time. So we need to mirror it and see, we need to see the context as well. Yeah, I can completely see that it's, it really needs to be um, a, a, a learning process. And oh, yes. what was interesting was when you, when you talked about how then the teachers could then reflect on the different stages and the different bits of the sequence of teaching and see what bits needed to be more explicitly taught. So I thought that was really, really interesting, really mm -hmm. interesting. Um, perhaps the last question, because uh, we're coming out to the end of the hour, but um, how do you deal with students who are ranked lowest? Does this lead to um, you know, low self-esteem or, or? I don't or, see. Um, I don't see why they. I think many students know that they are uh, perhaps low achieving, but they don't need to see the ranking. I don't see. I, I personally don't think the students should should see where they are placed, particularly not when they are in in the lower. But as you, as a teacher, you can identify them, and then you can see what they are. You get the opportunity. And not uh, yet another opportunity to support them. And also, they get the if you have peer assessment, you get the peer um, um, peer feedback that can support them as well. But you need to be very careful because you don't want um, you you need to. That's why it's important to have someone that can help you interpret the data. And, and so, what does this mean? Thank you. Um, you mentioned geography, you mentioned other subjects. Are you aware of any research that looks at um, subjects like maths? For yeah, example? there are a comparative judgment in math. There was a seminar at the Royal Society and uh, the, uh, the future of assessment in science education. I think it was 2016. There were a couple who presented and there were a couple of us who were invited as audience and then we had group discussions. And there is a report um, about that uh, and there there were I shouldn't I don't remember the name now but they were in mathematics because mathematics is also they're open-ended they're not just one correct answer mathematics is such a that's debatable <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a math teacher I know that <laughs> no, get it, there. you think that the, the bias towards mathematics is just one answer that's just one way to solve the problem but it isn't so it, it's applicable to to um, mathematics as well, depending on what kinds of tasks you are, you have, uh, your students have done. There's also done in music. There also been uh, like oral exams, and also been in. Um, I think it was a DPAC group who had tried it for applications for a job. The first sorting mechanism for the, if you get like lots of applications for for a job, then you can use peer comparative judgment. And I would love to see a comparative judgment round on like research applications for research grants, for instance. Like, well, who knows? Maybe someone will do that. So it's applicable. I use it when I when, when I go with my son to buy shoes. Actually, <laughs> you, you get a bit uh, uh, nerdy when you do this, but. Um, there are lots of shoes they, they wants to buy, and I present it with two. So which one is better <laughs> than this one? This one, and we end up buying one or perhaps two pairs of shoes. I sense a slight obsession with comparative judgment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, my my strongest passion and uh, compassion is to formative assessment and to adjust and what, to help the students learn more through teach through teaching and learning. And I think that came really, really strongly this morning. So thank you for your passion and your enthusiasm. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. And um, I do hope that um, the audience did too. Um, we're going to have to leave it here, Eva. So thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you for answering all the questions uh, and we'll send you the others. But I think we've addressed most, most of the different areas. Um, thank you. Have a lovely day and, and take good care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, well, we'll see you again tomorrow at 11. OK, bye. Bye, Eva. Take care. Take care. <laughs> Thank you.